coming and joining me here today. I'm Claire Davenport. I might be familiar to some of you and not so familiar to others, but I'm a geriatrician. I'm a doctor who works with older adults and I'm, I work over at Mount Sinai and I actually come here to see people on Thursdays. And um, it's been a really rewarding experience. Just wanted to start off our talk today with a little quote. Isn't it a bit unnerving that doctors call what they do practice? That's a George Carlin quote. And I, um, I do, I always thought, how can medicine be both a science and an art? And what I'm gonna to talk to you about today, about getting what you want out of your healthcare as an older adult, um, really zeroes in on a bit of what that art really means and how important of a role that you play as an advocate for an older adult in your life who you love and care for, or if you yourself are an older adult, what is it that you can actively do to get what you want out of what you are receiving right now? So the program that I work with is called Patient Priorities Care. And it's a project that was created at Yale. Um, my PI on the project, her name is Dr. Mary Tinetti. She's very well known in geriatrics. And she saw that the medicines and the treatments that people were receiving were not necessarily aligned with what mattered the most to them in their lives. And realized that if we could start to create a more patient-centric, person-centric care model, that we could really improve the experience of health across an entire paradigm of people. And so she set about doing that and created a program called Patient Priorities Care, which I'm now part of helping to implement nationally. So we have programs that are um, begun in the Cleveland Clinic, uh, across a whole health system with the VA, uh, primarily in Houston, myself over at Mount Sinai, and many other examples of early implementers of using patient priorities in care in practice. And I just wanna um, give you a, a, a little introduction to what patient priorities care and who it treats. Uh, but Jackie, Jackie Mason once said, it's no longer a question of staying healthy, it's a question of finding a sickness you like. <laughs> So it really zeroes in on people with multiple chronic illnesses. And, and chronicity is the thing, right? So chronicity means this thing doesn't go away. We're just gonna have to figure out how to be with what is happening. And you know, what happens with multiple chronic illnesses, they stack up, right? So one doesn't get better and go away, but they start to build and build. And suddenly you're going to the doctor and, and it's almost like you're a checklist of diseases and not a person anymore. So too many meds get ordered, too many doctors, extra doctors, and the doctors don't always agree. They'll give one recommendation and then it won't jive with the others. There are trade-offs. So the trade-offs that we're dealing with are, well, there's gonna be a side effect if I do this. Um, one disease is interacting with another disease. And at the end of the day, what I started off with talking about that art is really that interaction and the fact that there really is no one right answer when you get down to it. Um, so the more you know about what matters to you, the better you can guide your healthcare team and become that guiding light for what the best medical care you could possibly receive looks like. And when you work up together like that with your healthcare decisions, you start to see alignment with what you have prioritized as what is important to you. So I'm gonna break this down into two parts. The first part is identifying precisely what you want. And the second part is how to work with your healthcare team to get and receive what it is that you want. And you can do this yourself um, or have, a, or help your loved ones do this on our website, myhealthpriorities.org. That's my health priorities, all one word, dot org. So what matters most to you is what I mean by your health priorities. So Ingrid Goff Madoff once said, they sing, you are not the sum of your suffering. You're not 
all that you have done. You are not even the thoughts that you think. You and we are one. When I bring my sadness to the sea and I look to the horizon, from there I stand to eternity. Everything's so beautiful. As we enter into a space and we want to know what matters most, if we really want to do that, we really need to look inward for a moment. And although I don't do this with my patients in the clinic, I'm going to do this with you today. I'm going to take a pause and meditate for a moment together here. I want you to start with arriving here in this, mo in this room. Maybe put down your devices that you're holding in your hands or your pens and papers. Maybe take a moment to adjust your feet, your legs, and feel your body sort of, where is it in space right now? Maybe you can even just feel the space around you. Sense the aromas in the air, the sounds you're hearing. You might notice the pressure of your bottom in the seat or the feel of cloth over your skin. As you do this, you might hear this rhythm of your breath. It's happening all the time, supporting you in your life. Where do you feel your breath right now? Do you sense it at your nostrils? Maybe the back of your throat? Where does your breath live for you? Do you feel it in your chest? Can you follow your breath all the way to your belly? Noticing how it expands when you inhale and it relaxes as you have the breath move out. Inside of this quiet space that you're creating, place a question. What matters most to me in my life right now? As you do this, you might notice images, sounds, ideas. Begin to gently wiggle your toes and your fingers. And if your eyes were closed, you can begin to blink them open. You know, Steve Jobs once said, being the richest man in the cemetery does not matter to me, but going to bed at night saying we've done something, that's what counts. So I don't have people close their eyes and ask this question, but I ask really simple questions to them. What would you be doing if you were having a good day? Who or what matters most to you in your daily life? What activities are the most important or fulfilling? What things would you like to be spending more time doing? So when we ask a lot of people these questions, it falls, typically their responses fall into four categories. Connecting, that's family, friends, community, spirituality. Others might say enjoying life, productivity, personal growth or learning, recreation. Others may say functioning and dignity, a sense of um, a dignified way of being in the world and a sense of independence as they move about it. And lastly, it'll be peppered with oftentimes managing health. So symptoms, discomfort, 
questions around the quality of life that people are experiencing right here, right now. I don't know if anybody here felt comfortable, but did anyone want to share what sort of came to them as they thought what was the most important thing to them? Probably family. Family? Yeah, always. Yeah. Maybe specific faces. Connection, yeah. And communication. Mm, communication, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and so one of my goals is to take that value of connection, communication, uh, family, and start to work towards um, what that could look like in the day-to-day -day life. So, um, you know, someone once said, I don't need a perfect life. I just want to be happy, surrounded by good people who love me for who I am. And Winnie the Pooh says, I do remember, and then when I try to remember, I forget. <laughs> so what we really need are health goals. <laughs> So they need to be specific and realistic. And these are going to build that value that you know is the most what matters the most to you. They build them into your actual lived experience. So for example, if you valued doing activities with your family and friends and thought, okay, well, then I want to go out to eat once a week. But then thought, but I get tired and my fatigue is going to prevent it. I don't want to leave my wife alone at home then the goal needs to be something that aligns with what you're willing and able to do right now. So the goal setting is so important because it can use it at the end of the day as a measure of whether or not your healthcare is actually working for you or if it's just sort of spread out and, and not really zeroing in on you living your best life, you living your values. The next step that we have people do is to review their health symptoms. So I have people, um, what we would do on the website, you would write them down. And, and it's really whatever comes to mind for you about what's most limiting you from living your best life right now, living your values. And you may have like this inner checklist that's going off and you're already thinking of it for your loved one or for yourself. It could be eyes, eyesight problems, leg swelling, bathrooming troubles, poor sleep, weakness. And you know, if you're lucky, you only have a few, but even if you only have a few, they can be pretty serious. Arthritis pain can really be something that just totally inhibits your life. Or even just thinking about preventive medicine, that's really complicated nowadays. There are all these screenings and all these shots and things that we have to think about. So. Getting it all just out there off of, off of the mind and onto a piece of paper can be very helpful. And you'll start to see what are the one or two things that are always kind of coming up when I think about doing that thing that I love to do, this is the thing that's getting in the way. Um, and really zero in on what those might be. You know, Alexander the Great once said, I'm dying with the help of too many physicians. <laughs> so the next step we have is we review our healthcare tasks and medications. And what we're really looking for here is a balance. So each health goal that you set has an associated healthcare task that you have to do. So specialists, medications with side effects, all of these interventions come with you presenting an issue to your doctor. So the health goal you desire plus the healthcare tasks you're willing and able to do to achieve your goal, that balance is actually where your health priorities lives. So you wanna identify the tasks that you're doing now and what you're willing and able to do to achieve your goals. And you need to see what's too uncomfortable or bothersome right now in terms of what you're doing. And beyond that, are some of the things you're doing just not helping? This task list can get pretty long. So it can be vital signs at home, special diets, CPAP masks, using a walker or a cane, um, getting tests, 
like treatments and procedures like surgeries, um, colonoscopies, mammograms, and then your healthcare visits. This is a half a day of your life spent getting a health, one single healthcare visit, like a primary care doctor, a specialist, a counselor, rehab, occupational therapy. And then beyond that, community programs that are supporting you, the transportation it takes to get from A to B. And then on top of that, we have the simple medications, right? Not so simple. You may be on a list of 10, um, I've seen patients on 20 and you don't know um, sometimes what's actually helping and what's actually hurting you. And that can be a, a, just writing it down, look at it in front of you, see how much you're doing already for your health and what's going on in terms of your healthcare tasks. Zero in on what you're willing and able to do um, because that is gonna be key guidance for your medical team to understand what type of care you're willing to receive. The next step is to choose the one thing. Okay, that can be scary, right? So we just wrote out this, you know, we sort of like the, the, the beautiful mind whiteboard of all the connecting dots of all the things you're doing for the various conditions you're, you're working with, you're, you're dealing with on a daily level. And what we wanna do with this one thing to focus on is we wanna capture both the value, the thing you value most in your life right now the thing you want to achieve with your healthcare and what you're willing and able to do. And we're going to build into that the thing that rose to the top that was really getting in the way of you living your best life. So we just submitted an article um, to the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, uh, and hopefully it gets accepted. Um, but when we asked people to zero in on the one thing that mattered most to them, uh, in this healthcare visit, it would fall into three basic categories. Uh, a general symptom or impairment like musculoskeletal, the arthritis we were talking about, fatigue, dizziness, mobility, so that'd be more of a general symptom, or a health condition, so difficulty with sleep, diabetes, or hypertension. And then the third type of task would, would be around the healthcare tasks that were burdensome. So the other thing that people would say, the one thing I need to focus on are the number of medications I'm taking or a specific medication that's causing trouble or a special diet concern. So these three different kind of categories were, were the, what we saw in a general trend. Some examples were, I'd like to be less dizzy and have less hip pain in the morning so that I can go out to breakfast and see my friends. Sounds, sounds pretty reasonable. I would like to take less of the water pills so that I can get out more during the daytime to see friends and take trips. It makes going to it makes it get too much for me to go out during the daytime because I um, I have to take this pill and I have to get to a bathroom and I just I want to wait to take it until after I get home from church or after I go to the hairdresser. I wanted to improve my strength in my arms to lift things so that I could play with my grandson. So focusing on the one thing doesn't mean your healthcare team won't address all of the other problems, the medical problems that have been identified. It's a way to, a place to start. And then what it teaches them is what matters the most to you right now. I would like to trial less medication. If I have less medication, maybe I'll have a normal day. My anxiety is raising my blood pressure because I'm taking all these pills and it just seems like too much. That's, that's a lot to act on, and we'll get to that later. Your healthcare team can actually use this information to work through your, um, the one thing and looking, and looking at what you're willing and able to do to achieve your healthcare goals. Maya Angelou once said, one isn't necessarily born with courage, but one is born with potential. Without courage, we cannot practice any other virtue with consistency. We can't be kind, true, merciful, generous, or honest. So we do need to have a little bravery, right? This is a brave thing to go into a medical appointment and say, hey, this is the one thing that matters the most to me in my life. That's a vulnerability 
right there, especially if you're not there right now. Um, so letting your healthcare team know about your health goals, about your symptoms, what's helpful to you, what's burdensome, all of those are really important information to guide the type of care you're going to receive, rather than becoming a list of diseases and a list of medications, you are actually, it's a call to humanity. It's a call to who you are. And it actually is so valuable to humanize the entire experience of this art of medicine that we're discussing today. So you could go online to the myhealthpriorities.org, um, myhealthpriorities.com. Oh, I just messed my own thing up. <laughs> Org, it's org, myhealthpriorities.org website. And you can, you can actually write these all down because it'll walk you through all those steps that I talked about today. And then you can share that with your, your loved one's doctor or your doctor, and they can see what you're willing and able to do to achieve the goals that you want to achieve rather than having them set the numbers for you, right? Is the metric gonna be your blood pressure level and your A1C, or is the metric gonna be you got strong enough to play with your grandkids again, right? It needs to be the latter. It needs to be what matters the most to you. That is the goal you achieve. So, for example, you could say, is there something that will help me walk around my house without being so short of breath? And you can ask if treatments will help you with your health goals. So you could say, will this medication help my energy in the morning so that I can walk my dog? Or would this treatment improve my shortness of breath enough to get to lunch with my friends each day? So you can ask if the expected treatment, what, what would the effort be? So what exactly do I have to do on my own if I start insulin? What does that look like for me? getting back to what you're willing and able to do, engaging that. And you could be specific. So you could say, instead of saying, I don't like this medicine, say, this medicine makes me feel weak and dizzy. I can't go out to visit with my friends. I can't see my family. So in all of these examples, we add our value. We add what matters the most to us right now so that we can keep that as a, the, the marching orders for that is the end goal here is that I'm living my best life and that way your doctor knows what that looks like for you. So um, what concerns me most that's a good one also my main health goal is making sure that I can XYZ. I'm willing to X if it helps me meet my goals of YZ so those are some of the framing that you can just start out your appointment with. And as the appointment's going on, you can keep zeroing back. Well, is this gonna get us to that place where we're having dinner with mom again? Because that's our real goal, is that she can be alert enough each night that we can actually share a meal once a week um, at the assisted living, for example. So um, to wrap it up, I do want to share with you from the medical team's perspective, what we teach clinicians to do with this information. Because it's, in medical school, we're taught the diseases, we're taught the treatments for the diseases, and with chronic medical illnesses, we never, we're never really taught how to stack all these treatments up on each other and what that looks like. And, and there's a real reason for that too. A lot of the studies where we are treating a disease, they came from people who had one disease, that disease, not four, five, six, seven diseases, and not with markers of frailty and cognitive impairment. Typically, if there was any cognitive impairment, they were excluded from these trials of medication. Okay, so we are absolutely in a space where there is not one right answer. There are a lot of good answers, actually. We like to flip it, right? Instead of making it a challenge that there's no one right answer, there's not good data for this or that. If we can zero in on what matters most to that person, that family, that community, then we can actually create care that aligns with what matters most. So we teach three strategies to our doctors. 
and nurse practitioners and healthcare teams. And the first one is to use the patients, the person's health priorities as a focus of communication and decision making. So in this way, we're inviting discussions on each of the interventions. We're framing them around each health priority. That means acute medications for treatments that are acute and chronic interventions. And we also focus on achieving that activity rather than eliminating the symptoms entirely. So if it's chronic pain, then we, and all we wanna be able to do is to get to the restaurant, to visit with friends once a week, then we get the pain to a level where we're able to do that and we're able to enjoy that as much as we can. Rather than, I still have some pain, were you able, the question then becomes, well, were you able to do the thing that makes you feel you're living your best life right now? So, for example, um, I know I would have, a, a, in an encounter, we could say, I think, you know, your, your medications are causing you to fall, and this is keeping you from volunteering and doing your work. So let's start to help you achieve your goal to um, get back to volunteering by discontinuing one of your blood pressure medications that could be contributing to all these falls, right? So that way they're framing the entire intervention not around a number, oh, your blood pressure is X, Y, Z. Rather, they're saying, I want to get you back to that activity that made you feel connected. In this case, it was a, a volunteer, so more of a um, productivity um, type me metric. And um, what the doctor can be thinking is, okay, future trials could be physical therapy to ev evaluate the balance and gait and a home exercise program if they're willing and able, and then an informational printout about improving home safety, so looking for fall risks and hazard, and then exploring barriers to adherence to something like an assisted walking device. Maybe this person doesn't want to be using the, the walker as had been suggested, and it's just a matter of sort of understanding why aren't we adhering to that? What does that mean to you to be walking around with a walker? What does that feel like for you? So that gets me into my second um, point of what we teach doctors to do, and that is to use serial trials to start, stop, or continue healthcare interventions. And they're all based around achieving the health outcome goals. So these serial trials are really important to understand um, because, because of all the interactions of diseases and medications with one another, each time we engage with that medication list or we try something new or we continue doing something we're already doing, we're making a decision and it should absolutely align with what the goals of that individual are. So we, we, have, we offer multiple options of where to start. And we could say, if you're willing, we can try some different sleep apnea masks. Or we could also discuss changes to your medication because one of your medications could be causing the tiredness. Um, we could start decreasing the dose or even stopping it. And I just want you to understand your medication is for your heart failure, so we're gonna need to talk about what might happen if we make changes to the medication, but we can continue to follow your tiredness closely to see if you're able to get back to volunteering more. So we always bring it back. So we're gonna to try to change the, this one medication. We're gonna see if it improves your fatigue so that you can get back to volunteering. But we know there might be a trade-off. So we're gonna look for any problems with your heart that could arise. Um, at the end of the day, if you're not volunteering more, then that trial didn't work and we have many other things we could do. So you can imagine if you're gonna mess with a heart failure medication, there could be a cardiologist out there sort of scratching their heads, right? So we have to work with the doctors about reconciling these differing recommendations. How common it is to have one doctor say, I recommend this, and to have another say the exact opposite. And that can really create a lot of confusion and fear. And I just wanna say right now, I wanna normalize it. That is not something that just you alone are facing. Um, it's a huge challenge right now because people are developing multiple chronic illnesses and we have organists who are focused on one part of the body and what we are doing here, what I'm talking about here is really flipping the entire 
scenario to say, well, mom's goal is that we are having dinner once a week together at Inspire in the dining room and she has the energy to do it. And, you know, this is the two things I think are getting in the way of that. And I really, I think we need to focus on how we can get there. Do you think this intervention will help with that? Do you think this is a good idea? And that I think is a really good way to frame it across multiple specialists is to say, what matters most is this, can this become our focus of each appointment? Um, and that's what we train um, the clinicians to do across the specialties. So I, I wanted to end there, um, but to offer some space and time for questions or comments. Thanks. Anything come to mind? Yeah, so this approach is so, um, it's so reassuring and it's, it's really so gratifying on, on many different levels. And I'm just curious, um, you know, with um, memory care residents, for example, um, the healthcare partners, are they a part of this conversation? And do they understand that this is the approach and then like, when they read the notes for um, each patient, are they sort of being trained to think this way as well? That's the aspirational goal. So you're um, bringing up one of the special mentions um, around cognitive changes. So when what matters most becomes a community effort, right? A community um, definition um, defined by what care looks like about the symptoms that arise in receiving day-to-day -day care, um, about what, what matters most becoming sort of, out, is what I'm doing right now really in service to that uh, guiding light, which in this case, and especially as um, memory can get worse over time, um, the family becomes the source of what matters most. And so, in a facility like this, ideally, yes, like this would be what um, what the care partners would be doing, what um, and and would become sort of what matters most would always be sort of at the top of everybody's mind, um, not only in memory care but across the boards, right? For a highly functional marathon runner at the age of ninety three, um, you know that I remain functional and I get the surgery I need for my knee to work. You know, uh, it, it becomes an advocacy, right? So this advocacy for what matters most is something that um, that I, as you know, as a geriatrician, and what we're trying to train um, everybody to do is absolutely possible and um, and aspirational. Here, I think this is an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And then on that note, too, um, the the with the point you brought up about how the family does start to play a bigger role these decisions and going through their own learning curve in doing so because it's basically you know you're, you're beginning to feel like wow I'm making a decision for a person who is my mother or my spouse and I wouldn't I would normally never you know think that I would be in that position to do so so there's just a learning curve there and so um, is that part of the conversation too with the with the healthcare partners to be sensitive to that and understand that that's where you know where we're coming from? So I can only speak to my role as the geriatrician. So as I'm engaging in those conversations with families, um, what we're talking about here is the learning curve of working with a loved one who has dementia, um, and how making decisions can create uh, sometimes even a moral dissonance or distress um, because you're speaking on behalf of an entire very rich and full lived, fully lived human being who right now really needs you um, and cannot make a decision on their own. So for one, I would start, I always start with acknowledging how powerful that relationship is and how key and important but also that there's a grief there, that there's a, there's a loss there that needs to be stated and acknowledged. 
um, I always like to begin there because um, the emotions that we feel around caring for people are, are the wave, but we are the ocean, right? So there's, there is an ocean of um, decisions that need to be made and um, moments to be had. And so the wave needs to be acknowledged so that we can get to really the playing field of the cognition, of thinking through of the trade-offs of this intervention or this next um, part of the care plan. Um, you know, should we push them to eat more? You know, all of these questions that kind of bubble up in all the lists of symptoms that we, we are very worried about. So what I love about this model, even though it hasn't been um, conducted officially in dementia care, I use it all the time with families because it helps us to get to that one thing and to get to that value. And once we've zeroed in on that value, it makes your decision making a lot more clear. Mm -hmm. Because if the value is mom would, um, would rather a good quality of life and not quantity, we can peel away from some of the preventive stuff and we can start looking at that arthritis pain really seriously, mm -hmm. right? Because then we're zeroed in on the ones that are, the things that are most getting in the way of having dinner together once a week. Yeah, you know, we, we get that, down to that, that really granular goal and we measure everything we're doing around it so we can start to peel off the things that aren't helping, get rid of the things that are potentially causing side effects and zero in on things that are really gonna get us there. Um, but I just, I do, I start out with acknowledging that it's a grief, it's a loss, and it's a change over time um, that happens either progressively or quickly, and it can be, it can be a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 because I, I feel like, you know, just speaking for myself and what I've noticed within myself is there is, there is that grief, and it is, um, it, it's, you know, it's, I don't have an outsider's perspective. I haven't, I have very much in it. And so um, it's a day to day, you know, not, not knowing what to expect and there are surprises within, within that. And um, it, you know, I, I am more vulnerable as a result. And so I think I really love that this is the approach and I love that this is the conversation for everybody. And the only, yeah, I would just, I feel like what, the only part for me so far that's been a little bit sharp or a little bit rough around the edges is the acknowledgement that of what we're going through as the family members um, with the healthcare partners. And it, it's a lot. It's a lot for them to take in. And I, I just feel like this is such a, a strong and clear approach. Um, so I'm excited that that's. Yeah. And you can advocate for that in your relationships with any healthcare provider that you're engaged with um, and at any level. So by framing everything that either that you're asking another to do, even on behalf of mom or dad or whomever, <laughs> spouse, um, that you, that, um, so you can take this um, specific goal and what matters most and just keep on chipping at it and say, is this really gonna get us to where, what matters most to us? I, I've worked with a family once who, the one thing that mattered most was for mom to be able to pray with them each night in the living room, that she would be awake enough at a certain time when everybody in the family was there, a very close-knit family, grandkids, everybody there, and to just have that, that period of time, and that was right in the middle of her sundowning period each night. But it was so important for the family to have that time to connect as a group because this time that we have on earth is so precious and we want to make the very best of it and the most of it so that I had that clear direction. We focused on all of the different behavioral modifications we could do around sundowning and the way we could create the space that would be safe where she wouldn't feel agitated. Um, and we did it from a multimodal approach and we got them there. Um, they're not doing it every night, they can't, but they're able to do this three times a week. So if the better you can get down to a goal or two goals 
and, and keeping to that one thing that matters most and, and working with across the boards, the specialist, the care partner, whomever it is, and you keep on that, that, that's clear, that clear guiding light, the clearer everything will become. So it won't be, so she had like 15 different symptoms. And, but the thing we focused on was getting to pray together and you'd be surprised how quickly those other symptoms just dissolved mm -hmm. because that was the rhythm of that family. Mm -hmm. So um, instead of going, the caregiver came in with a list of 15, mm -hmm. literally. And I, I let them speak it, we talked through the grief, and then we got down to what mattered most. And it was praying together. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get there. So mm -hmm. I encourage you, you're on a good path. Um, you have a deep wisdom in you that that knows knows what's best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, my wife developed Alzheimer's in the nineties. She's just been a curse, and uh, it's changed our lives dramatically. And this is the first thing that I do every time in downtown. So I want to pause there. So yes, dementia takes a lot away, right? It's the disease, not the person. So the disease is our enemy, not the person. Right. So when, when we apply what matters most, then you would think, well, what is it in our relationship that matters most? Is there a sense of peace when you're eating together? Is it a sense of when my, my children visit, we're all um, able to take a walk together. So to zero in on something that matters the most in your relationship now, that's possible. With what, you, what we have in the setting of this terrible and horrible dementia. Because I hear a lot of frustration in what you're saying, and that is an absolutely valid feeling to have. But there's also an opportunity to discover what in your relationship is working or could be working better if some symptom or some piece of this was a bit better too. So identifying a health goal would be really, really a good thing for you to do for your wife, to do together, maybe even talk about. There's no, obviously there's no, there's no treatment or cure for Alzheimer's, hmm. but the Alzheimer's Association, don't they have that? They have programs so we won't be able to, we'll actually, you and I can talk about this in five minutes because you'll be coming upstairs to the 14th. Um, so we'll put a pin in that. Anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. I just want to mention that um, bringing your spouse over here in sort of against his will because he wants to be at home, to stay at home. Um, it's a very, very difficult situation. It's either like getting a divorce or let's say the death or whatever. And it's, it's a very, very difficult situation for, for the, the, care, the caregiver. And um, so it was a mutual, a mutual decision, of, a family decision to do it. And, um, and I thought every day is a new day. And just this week, the question was, when am I going home? Yeah. And uh, I, I have a goal, and I'm trying to implement, you know, to tell him that's my goal so we can be a couple. And um, that's a very difficult situation. 
and there is no cooperation. I, I totally hear you. Um, so when your health goal for your loved one who has significant physical, um, emotional, or cognitive disability, how um, there can be a dissonance between uh, the needs of caregivers and uh, the recipients of care. Um, and trying to find a harmony is one of the most challenging parts and can take um, it can take a lifetime uh, of, but w the one thing I would say is that if you've identified that, you've, you've actually identified a really clear goal, which is to enjoy the relationship. I get even more granular. I would say to enjoy this relationship, I would want to be out at that cafe for 15 minutes having a coffee together once a week. Some, some, some totally doable potential goal. And you get out there and maybe there's a, a problem, maybe you know, maybe medical issue gets in the way most days, but you get out once and you know that week. You can say, ah, and your brain gets that little bit of uh, you know, motivation and says, okay, I'm on to something, right? So that's why we wanna get real granular on what that goal looks like. Not some general, when we close our eyes and we see what those people are, what that experience is that we want, that's the value. So now we bring it to, to this place and to this plane and we say, what does that look like specifically? Specifically and realistically. And I, I think you're on the right path. Yeah. So I'm actually at the end of my time. My appointment's starting again soon. But I've just, just totally enjoyed talking with you all um, and hearing your ideas and thoughts. And thank you for being so interactive. I could have given us a whole other half an hour for talking. Um, but thanks so much for, for attending my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Devin.